Theater is a form of connection and communication all centered around the art of collaboration. From the community playhouse and educational institution to the many regional theaters on Broadway and in the corporate entertainment world, including cruise ships and industrial events, collaboration is at the heart of every show, every production. Collaboration is the blending of art and science, of creativity and the production process. It is the dance that happens when artists, technicians, designers, producers, musicians, marketers, and a wide variety of passionate individuals bring their talents together to develop a singular experience. Projects with Jason is one such collaboration seeking to inspire, educate, connect, and entertain through a series of unique, multifaceted experiences which seek to explore the wonderful spirit that is generated when professionals of all backgrounds and experiences intersect with rising theater students and educators. Bringing together working professionals and talented students in a crucible of collaboration that happens when you put people together in a room and charge them to create something. The results are very special. This series of works is designed to enrich and inspire students, educators, artists, and all others as we look to connect, be entertained, and grow as artists and human beings. I'm Jason Daunter. Join me and our Projects with Jason team as we explore the world of innovation, design, and all things behind the scenes of live entertainment. Designed to showcase key professionals and enable interactive dialogue between theater students and these artists. Hosted by Principal Lighting Designer for the Disneyland Resort, Casey Wilkerson. Casey is joined by one of the industry's best stage managers, my friend, Lisa Dawn Cave. Lisa Dawn is currently the production supervisor for Frozen Worldwide. She brings her years of experience and amazing spirit to us today. Join us behind the tech table. Hey everyone, I'm your host, Casey Wilkerson, and welcome to Tech Table, where we bring students and educators together with notable backstage artists from across the entertainment industry. And in this episode, we're focusing on the eye of the theater hurricane, stage managers. Now, when we think of stage managers, a, a, a picture comes to mind, right? So there's this hyper-organized person who is surrounded by three ring binders, a ruler, and an endless supply of sharpened number two pencils. And patience, lots and lots of patience. But it's more than that, right? It's, it, it's way more than that. Part psychiatrist, parent, multitasker, first responder, sympathetic ear, taskmaster. It, it seems like the role of the stage manager may just be one of the most complex careers you can consider pursuing in entertainment. And we're grateful to have one of the very best in the industry joining us in this episode to talk about that. Lisa Don Cave. Hey there. Hello. How are you? I'm fantastic. <laughs> Excellent. That is great to hear. <laughs> so we have lots of cool stuff to talk about today. Uh, we, we've got a couple of students and educators that we're going to meet a little bit later, and they've got some very specific questions for you. We want to have a conversation about that. But before we get into that, I wanted to start with you because you've got this fascinating story of beginning a career as a dancer and then transitioning to stage management. So let's let's, so let's break that down into baby steps, right? So <laughs> what inspired you to to want to pursue dance in in the first place? Um growing up, I just always loved to sing and dance, you know. My mom said that's all I could do. I would sit in the living room and 
instead of going outside, I just put on records and I'd be singing. You know? <laughs> and, um, I would, you know, go to community theater and just learn, you know, African dance and street dance. That was my train before I went to high school. Okay. You know, and then my mom found the high school performing arts and I auditioned for that. And I got in and um, I actually, what they would call started late because I actually started my f professional training when I was 14. Oh, okay. So it was late as a dancer to start, but apparently they were, you know, able to, they looked at me and said, she's got something, so let's do it. <laughs> so, yeah. So that's where I had my training, started ballet training, modern dance, you know, all of it. All of it. So, so now... You know, in the context of your high school education, is, is it something you knew you wanted to pursue yes. into college and beyond and, and, exactly. and to dance? Exactly. I knew that I wanted to be a performer. I, loved, I wanted live theater, musicals. That's what I wanted to do. And my first love of all of it was dancing. You Got know? it. So... Um, what was your first exposure to, or some of your early exposure to? You mentioned community theater, going to what, going to see shows, and did you you performed in in high school? And how how did that love of of of, of theater specifically start? Right, because in, in high school I was a dance major, so it was mostly um, you know like Swan Lake, the actual classical things of dancing, um, but I also loved to sing. So I said to myself, I didn't want to just be in a dance company. I wanted to be able to do musicals, which allowed me also to sing. Sure, sure. Um, so I also, you know, took some singing lessons in high school. Also, they gave us that to be, you know, well-rounded. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I knew that that's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life as my career is being in theater. So when mom said, you're going to college, I'm like, <laughs> well, can I go to college for theater? <laughs> you know? And uh, so that's what happened. I auditioned for uh, colleges and I uh, got into SUNY Purchase and went there oh. as a dance major. Okay. So, so tell me, tell me a little bit about your college experience, per, per, performing in shows and really focusing on, on, on trying to uh, come out of that with a career as a dancer. Yeah. Correct. Correct. And, um, I graduated from college in 83. Um, and back then, so like so far, 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 far away, but back then you you actually had specific majors. Right now they do more rounded where you take up other things in the theater. Oh, okay. You know? Right, but now back then, dance major, you just concentrated on dance. You didn't do any acting classes, you didn't do any singing, it was majorly dance. And it was like continuous. I mean, I would go into you know the dance building for a nine o'clock class in the morning, you know, and then I would have lunch at 12 and then I was back there again at one. And most of my, you know, liberal liberal um, arts, I took at night. I took it from seven to 10 at night, you know, really? because, you know, you really wanted to, you know, hone in on your skills and yeah. you wanted to be in every like, you know, production or senior project, you know, so you made sure your days were free. <laughs> so you can do that. So you know, you, you just ate, lived, and breathed dance all the time. You know? That that makes a lot of sense. So now so you so you complete college and then you're going out into the world. What was that? So so we get a lot of questions from high school students, especially on the performer side, about what is what is that really like that first year that first you know or or first several years of of really just you know pounding the pavement and going to auditions and and trying to book a gig what was that like for you well you know what um i started in college and i think you should because remember you don't have you're not uh going to school in the summer right so what i did for my summer is i would audition and i would get scholarships you know i got a scholarship to avenelli so i was able to still do my training and you also would, you know, audition just to get, you know, some skills. So yeah. you would use that time that you weren't in school to prepare yourself when you graduated and you were going to really be out there. You know, so I always tell students when you have that time off, try it out, you know. Um, and what could happen is after my first year of college, I auditioned and I got into a road company of the Wiz. And I was like, I want to do that. And I went home to my mom and said, I got it. And she said, you're going back to school. <laughs> I was like, no. So we actually made a deal because I said, you know, I'm only going to really know if I want to do this if I do it, mom. So she said, OK, I will let you take a year off from school. You can go on tour, but you have to promise whether or not you like it or not. Even if you love it, you have to finish college. So I took a year off 
and I went on the road. I loved it. And I said, okay, I made a deal. I went back to school, but I crammed and I got out. So overall, I got out in three and a half years instead of four, because I was like, I know I want to do it. So it 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 sounds like you were blessed with with an amazing situation and and parents that were very supportive. That's yes. that's awesome. Yeah. yeah, very supportive. Well, and the fact that they were willing to 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 make a deal with you because they're well, I mean, like back when I was in college, the the you know, whenever you said you were going to be a theater major, you know, the the question out of every parent's mouth was, "So what's your plan B?" Right. And I was like, right. "Well, I don't I don't really want a plan B. Don't need a plan B because because yeah. plan A is going to work. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, and so that's that's just so great that 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 they were supportive from an early age. That's mm -hmm. that's awesome to hear. Yeah. So so now the whiz you traveled toward for a year. What was what what was that like? It was amazing. It was amazing. I mean, um, also on, back then, you know, right out of school. It was a non-union gig, um, so it was really treacherous because we were, we lived in that bus. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> I mean, to a point where where you sat, you made like a home. You had pictures up. You had little <laughs> tchotchkes. I mean, you lived on this bus, right? <laughs> um, but you know what? It was amazing because it was a way of seeing the United States that was unbelievable. Yeah. When you do it by that way, it, you, you see the country. It was unbelievable. And I would not give that up for anything. That, that to have that experience at a young age is is incredible. I've I've I, like on almost every one of these shows, we we talk about touring and how uh, how much that can inspire growth I, as as an individual, as a human, uh, and then as a performer as well, because being on the road is all about change from not only from day to day, but hour to hour to minute to minute sometimes. Exactly. Um, and you you find out really quickly whether or not you flourish in that environment. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So, so uh, we were talking yesterday, and I had told you that I had narrowly missed seeing you in in Cats. So, tell me about the 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 couple of years between being on tour in the Wiz and then finishing college, and then and then booking your first Broadway gig. Right. Oh man, um, I graduated in '83, and I got my union card in '84. Awesome. I actually booked some gigs. I did Bubbling Brown Sugar. I got my car doing Golden Boy at the Billy Holiday Theater in Brooklyn. Okay. Before. And then I did uh, uh, Bubbling Brown Sugar. And then I, while I was doing that, I auditioned for Cats. And I got it. And I, it was a third national company on the road. So I went back on the road. And I was on the road for two years okay. uh, with Cats. And that was amazing. You know, uh, much better than non-union. It was <laughs> get, get that union gig. Yeah, um, so it goes with that thing, right? <laughs> when, um, when yeah. On the performer technician side. <laughs> but I performed, I was on the road for two years. And then after the two years, they brought me to Broadway. And then I did Broadway for a year and nine months. Got it. Unbelievable experience. So now, is there a difference between, you know, your. I mean, that's that, that not the easiest dance show in the world to do, obviously. And then there's the traveling on top of that. How how do you maintain that conditioning to be able to do that many performances a week? That's that takes a lot of diligence. It it, it does. Um, I also was very very young um, at the time, but <laughs> always helps. <laughs> yes. But you also, I mean, the energy is there that you want to do it. And, you know, there are classes that you take to keep yourself in shape. Because even though you're doing a show, you still want to keep, you know, this tool, which sure. is your body, in shape. So I would still take class, you know. I had my tapes for my vocal, you know, vocalese, you know. Mm -hmm. So I could practice in my room. Right. Um, so you, you have those things that you have to take with you, even though you're on the road. You know, yeah, so you yeah. keep yourself going. So you don't let it just go because you do have to keep in shape to do those eight shows a week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. So we're back in New York. We're on Broadway. We're in Cats. Right. Wow. That's that's a, that's a heck of a credit to have, right, on your resume at a young age. Yes. So then then where do we go from there? What happens next? Um, I still was performing because I uh, had a performance performer credits for 10 years. So mm -hmm. I did Cats on Broadway, then I did Jerome Robbins Broadway National Tour, and then I did 
uh, Guys and Dolls national tour. Okay. That was from 92 to 94. And then when I was in Guys and Dolls on the road, <laughs> again, so I was on the road a lot. Um, <laughs> while I was doing that, you know, I was just saying to myself, you know, the dancer has the shortest career, you know? So what am I going to do when my body says, I can't do this anymore? And I wanted to take charge of that. I didn't want it to happen and I didn't have a plan. Got it. You know, so I yeah. said, what yeah. else can I do? And I don't want to leave the business. What else can I do? I have to stay in theater. I want to do live theater. What can I do? And of course, when you're on the road, you form a family. You know, you're with the crew all the time. Right. <laughs> you know, stage managers, company managers, you, you're a family. So that's what I started looking at. I said, what else can I do? And I would look and see what the stage management would do. I said, wait a minute. Can I do that? You know? And over the years of performing, I actually, you know, became friends with a lot of stage managers. Mm -hmm. um, so I called a friend of mine and I said, I, I think I want to try learning how to do that. What do you think? And he was like, if that's what you want to do, I'll help you. And I, I, I'm sure you're going to be great at it. You know, so that's basically I made a decision that I was going to have a career, my next career before the career I had was going to stop. So I had a plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's that takes a tremendous amount of 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 forethought and <clears throat> and the ability to just to just accept certain realities in our industry yes. uh, uh, about longevity. Yes. And I, I, I the 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 fact that that you got out ahead of that I think is just incredible. And yeah. and we're able to take all of that learning and knowledge and apply it in a completely different way. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> you know, exactly. Because, you know, I, I have to say, a dancer's mind, you know, what we have to pick up with those steps and memorize as quick as we have to, the musicality that we have to have, right. um, knowing where that comes from, the drive, the feeling, that energy, all helped me when I started learning stage management. And I took that with me and I still have it with me, you know, my yeah. background of that training yeah, that yeah, yeah. To, to make me the fullest that I am as a stage manager. So now when you, when you decided you wanted to make the transition into stage management and you started looking around and, and, and trying to book those types of gigs, what was it, what was it like to transition really from, from one to another? Was that, was that Rocky or? No, it wasn't. And I know some people will go, wait a minute. <laughs> but actually, um, I believe that you're in the right place at the right time and it is for you. It's going to be there. And I have to tell you, um, I had, unfortunately, when a door closes, one opens, I had an unfortunate door close really quick on me because when I was um, doing Guys and Dolls, I happened to come home um, uh, on a weekend to look for a house, my first house. And I was in a car accident, very okay. bad car accident, and busted my knee and my foot. And I had to, yeah. And I had to, you know, go into physical therapy. So I wasn't able to go back to the show. So I was in physical therapy trying to get myself together. And the doctor was like, you know, you need this amount of weeks, six weeks. Did my six weeks, went back to the doctor. He goes, you're not ready yet. Had to call the show back, not ready to come back. Took another, I don't even remember whether it was another four weeks. And the doctor said to me, I have to tell you that your healing has kind of plateaued. Wow. It's it's done, it's done. It's not happening anymore. And you are not going to dance anymore eight shows a week in high heel shoes or <laughs> on a dance. So the reality hit me. I was like, it was a shock. It wasn't what I was ready for. Right, right. But I had already started looking at something else. And that same friend, I said, it's now. It's now or never, <laughs> you know, and um, he actually spearheaded me into it, you know, because he was very, very um, well known and he would get phone calls, you know, you know, do you know this person? Do you know that person? And he got me my first gig. That, that is pretty incredible. Turning, yeah. turning that, well, having the forethought again to, to like plan that far in advance and then you know, having an unfortunate obstacle or a roadblock come up and right. then going, okay, well, you know, this wasn't my timing, but at least I have a plan. I've thought yeah. about this. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. So now was your first, so, tell me about your, your, the first couple of shows you stage management. Did you go right into like, 
uh, it's like, oh my gosh, I'm not dancing anymore. I'm going to stage manage a Broadway show. Was it that fast? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a I lot of people that. let me say that, yeah. but my first stage management gig was the revival of Showboat with Hal Prince on Broadway. So, yeah. Just, so Holly, start, start actually, that, the shot that you're showing was my first PSM gig. Ah, got it, got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. So, <laughs> so wait, so, okay, so wait, back up. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't prepare you for that. <laughs> no, that is intimidating. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay. Now, I, yeah. I, I've, I've, I've a million questions. Um, <laughs> um, so a couple of them are going to wait because they they fit in with what we want to talk about later. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. what was that? So so what was? Tell me what the phone call was like when somebody calls you and says we'd like for you to stage manage Showboat on Broadway with Al. Well, Prince there were four on the team. There okay. were four on the team, and um, when I say the right place at the right time, the right person, and everything, what it was was um, if you know Showboat, you know the story of Showboat, right? Mm -hmm. um, it is a very interracial cast, right? Um, so what they were looking for was a very diverse, you know, inclusive stage management team to look like the cast. Got it. So they had four stage managers and they were looking for an African-American also to fit into the group. Um, and back then there weren't that many, there were like a handful that were actually yeah. working and they were working. Um, and, um, so when my buddy who was the one who was training me and teaching me and having me like go and look at what people do and shadow people. Cause that's what I was doing. I was just like looking up, you know, mm -hmm. he got the phone call and said, do you know anybody that could fit this slot? Because we're re really looking for someone to make this team whole. Yeah. And he said, I do. I do have to tell you that she has not stage managed yet but she does have 10 years of experience as a performer. So it's not like she's right off the street and sure. don't know. You know? <laughs> um, and they said, okay, let's, let's interview. And I went to four interviews. So wow. I did go through it, you know, questions, sure, sure, yeah. and getting to know me and everything. And, you know, I had to go from the, um, the GMs, the producers, um, had to meet with Hal Prince, you know, and him to interview me at the time, Ruthie, which is his, was his stage manager who did everything for him and then became like his assistant. Yeah. I had to go through her. <laughs> um, so it got down to it. And they said, uh, finally that, you know, they said, we don't know, you don't, you don't know much, <laughs> <laughs> but every time we ask someone about you, they said, I know she's going to be great and she's going to do the job. So, even though she doesn't know much now, she knows enough to fill that fourth position right now that you're looking for. Sure. sure. And I'm sure she's going to work her tail off, you know, and that's what I did. Um, so I got the gig and I worked my butt off to learn everything <laughs> I could. And I'm telling you the background of my dance training, because I had the musicality, like I said, because showboat pulling that show was all about the music. Sure. Um, the dancing, I was, I knew how to do blocking because of choreo. I looked at blocking as choreography. So, so they put me in the slots of what, you know, were my strengths mm -hmm. and then kept teaching me everything else. You know, I was the one that was usually in the, um, dance rehearsals, you know, to take yeah. the blocking, you sure. know? Um, and Susan Stroman was the choreographer there. She knew my background, you know? So I also, believe it or not, when I was in that company, I tagged on periodically the dance captain role. Because okay. when the dance captain went on vacation, they had an assistant and the dance captain. And when the, um, the assistant would go on vacation, Susan said, I want Lisa to step into that spot. Because she knew, I knew, you know, I knew I could pick it up. And right. I was on the management team, stage management team. Yeah, so instead yeah. of picking somebody else in the cast, that would feel kind of awkward in and out as the dance captain because they were right there with their peers. Sure. She said, I want, so actually I took on the assistant dance captain along with my stage management duties when the assistant would go um, on vacation or personal days or take time off, you know? Yeah. That is cool. So, okay. So, 
there's there's a hundred things I love about this. I mean, the, the, from 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 the fact that a production company back then took representation that seriously uh, is 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 incredible and amazing mm -hmm. and awesome. And then the fact that it 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 sort of reinforces a lot of the discussions that we've had on previous episodes, which is the things that you learn in this field in this industry are not necessarily applicable only to what it is you're doing. Yeah. They're, they're skills that can be deployed elsewhere yeah. should you ever need to, either elsewhere within the industry or or outside of the industry. It's, yes. it's There's so much knowledge that comes with all of our different roles and that knowledge can be applied just about anywhere. I think that's awesome. It really can. And I always try to encourage and tell people, if you want to stay in the business, there is something else I'm sure you can do and that you would love. And I have mentored actually quite a few dancers that have called me and come and said, I want to do that. I think I can do that. And I have, and they are full fledged stage managers, you know, yeah. and I also even know a dance, you know, some dancers have gone into company management. Oh, sure. 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 Yeah, so you can, it's, it, it's out there. Just know that if you want to stay in the business, there are other things. And I'm not just saying a dancer, anyone, if you want sure. to change careers and you want to stay in, I am sure you can use those skills somewhere else. That's that's really awesome. Okay, so we're we're in, we're we're working on Showboat, and uh, so then we get to you get to the part where you start getting more responsibilities. Obviously, you're yes. you're you're successful. You're working, and uh, the opportunity comes up to be a production stage manager. Right now, is that something that that you had set your sights on at one point, or was it just something that 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 kind of popped up as as an um, opportunity? Both, meaning it, I knew it was something I was going to keep pursuing. I knew okay. I wanted to keep going up the ladder to be in charge. Okay. <laughs> I knew that. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> and again, it, you know, those people that you meet along the way, you know, they, if you stay close to them or, or you have a good impression of your skills and your work ethic, it stays on their mind. Because my first PSM gig, again, how Prince. Got it. Okay. okay. My first PSM gig on Broadway was Hollywood Arms. And he called me when I was doing, um, I was the first assistant on Into the Woods on Broadway, the revival. Okay. And he called me and he said, I'm doing Hollywood Arms and I want you to PSM this for me. And I was like, what? <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, I didn't make a phone call. I didn't do he called me and said, I want you to do this. And I was like, oh. Okay. And he, goes, I, and he always called all of us, you know, young ones, kid. Hey, kid, I know you can do it, kid. I know, you know. And he was a really good promoter to to bring young talent and push them along, That's you know. Awesome. And uh, yeah, he called me and said, I want you to do this. And of course, I said, I was terrified. Okay. Terrified. Yeah. You know, because this is my, my, you know, first PS game, PSM gig on Broadway. Whoa. But I said, yes. I said, yes. <laughs> And I knew I had those other folks that um, my mentors along the way, I knew I could give them a call whenever I needed to. If I couldn't answer a question, I knew I could call. And that's the one thing I tell people to this day. I am not afraid to ask a question to anyone. Yep. I don't assume. If I don't know, I'm not going to play. Oh, I don't want to look bad. Because when I fail in front of you, I'm going to look bad. So right. I'm going to say, I don't have that right now. I'll get that for you. You know? Yeah. But I, yeah, I reached out to a lot of folks to help me along the way, um, especially when I got my first PSM gig. Yeah. 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 So, so what I, what I love is you, you were like, you said you were terrified, but said yes anyway. That, that's so incredible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I think it's a huge lesson. I think so many, I, I think a lot of younger performers and technicians need to hear it. There's this, um, I guess sometimes there's a misperception of the fact that you have either done something for a while or you get to a certain point in your career and and the there's a the the fear goes away, right? But it's like there's always something there where there's like the next step yes. and there's always a certain amount of trepidation, even if you have confidence in you know sort of a general confidence in your skills and what you can do and all of that, yeah. there's still like there's a leap right that that you have to take and it's a total leap of faith 
And sometimes it's super scary to do that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've been doing this for I don't know how long. And, you know, I'm still nervous when, you know, um, once I tech a show and mm -hmm. I have to call it all at once. When it, And most of the musical I do are, are huge, big musicals, you know, a lot of responsibility. Yeah. And I'm still nervous when I call my first show and the yeah. first couple of shows after that and after that. Yeah. You no, know, I am. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So one of the things I wanted to ask you about was, uh, was you, uh, were stage manager for Rocky on Broadway. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So now I, I never got to see that show, but, uh, you know, I've, we've seen, I've seen pictures, I've seen videos that looks like a bit of a technical monster. Yes. Was, what was the, uh, what was the, like the rehearsal and tech process for that? Like, I have to tell you to this day, Rocky was the most difficult tech show I have ever done. Really? Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, is, oh, yeah. So, so I, some of this may be dim in my memory, but the, the like the boxing ring came out like into the uh -huh. audience. It came out into the audience. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I remembered that correctly. <laughs> and before it came out into the audience, it lived in the air. Okay. And tilted sometimes oh, that's and moved right. across right. above you, came <laughs> down and, and then it decided in the last 20 minutes of the show, it wants to come out all the way into the audience. I mean, it took your breath away and it was the adrenaline and it was fabulous, but that show, nervous, <laughs> nervous. I don't, I mean, it, yeah, that was the most difficult technical show I had ever done. That it sounds what that sounds like to me from somebody who could never ever in the world be a stage manager because I just couldn't handle the pressure. That sounds like multiple opportunities to have a heart attack in one night in, in two yeah. and a half hours. Yeah. <laughs> now, yeah, because even you know, you have all that technical stuff, you have actors, you know, that you're responsible for, right? You know, right. a crew, everybody around you that you're responsible for on that stage, you know. So it was, it was, it was nerve wracking, it really was. I have to tell you, I had this tradition that, and I do it for all my shows and uh, Jason will know this. Um, I need to take it. I'm very good with power naps. I'm one of those people that can take a 10 minute nap and I'm, I am refreshed. And before the shows, especially if it's a very hard show, I find a place and you, and then Rocky, there wasn't much room cause it was, a, you know, crowded <laughs> under my desk. <laughs> I would, I look at my team and I go, 10 minutes before I call the show, I'm out. I would go underneath my desk and I would lay there quiet with my eyes closed mm -hmm. for 10 minutes wow. before I went up to the booth to prepare. And I needed to do that to just calm myself down, get myself focused. And that's what I had to do. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so, so going from frozen or sorry, going from Rocky, ultimately getting towards frozen. Right. Yes. I mean, it's like, there's so how many years, cause Rocky was seven oh my years goodness. Ago? nine years ago. I can't remember. Oh wow. I can't remember either. Yeah. <laughs> it was, was a couple I was, of shows. It was a couple of shows between that because after Rocky, yeah. I, I think I did fun home and then I did shuffle along and then I did humans. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And then, and then Disney calls and says, Hey, would you like to spend a little time in Arendelle? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, actually with Disney, um, I was recommended okay. uh, for that. Uh, and I had to go in for an interview and it was quite, I don't know how many of us were up for that, but there were a few of us. So it wasn't just Lisa Dawn, you're in. Boom. Yeah. Um, I went in for the interview, the director at the time, Alex Timbers was the director um, first at the time, and he was the one who said, I want her to do this because I did Rocky with Alex. Okay, got it. Um, so, I, but I still had to go through the process because Disney did not know me at all. You know, I never worked anything with them. So I still had to go through the process of interviews um, with other folks. Sure. Um, but um, finally they were like, yeah, you know, we were, you know, you got all these credits. If every, every phone call we make, everybody's yep, yeah, she's, your, she's your person, she's your person. Um, Alex was very much for me. So um, I got the gig and it was great. They hired me a year before they needed me. So I knew already, you know, <laughs> I was going to do it, which is great. Um, as you know, thing, directors and choreographers changed along the way. But sure. um, I, they kept me on 
you know, they kept me on. And um, then with Michael Grandage coming on, I met him. He was a new director and they said, this is who we have. And uh, I'm sure he had, you know, he, he could, if he wanted to, if we did not click, he could have probably said, you know, but um, we met, I interviewed and um, we worked really well together, really well together. And I, I, I had been with the show from the very beginning. <laughs> and so that led to your current role, right? Yes. So um, tell us a little bit because because this is I mean once you start doing theater with a corporation things get a little different. Mm -hmm. So what is your like? Tell everybody a little bit about what your role is currently. Right, right now I moved from production stage manager to production supervisor. Uh, production supervisor, I am right now in charge of all of the frozens that happen right now, um, and worldwide. So. The first show we put out was the national tour. Mm -hmm. So basically I'm the person um, that interviews the stage management team for that. Um, and then I'm the person that um, sits with the designers when there are changes that are gonna happen because you know certain things have to change from a sit down when it yep. goes on the road. And so I'm in the room with all of them when they're talking about this. And since I know how the show works because I technically put it together for Broadway, you know, I can bring up a red flag going, well, if we do that, then that snowballs into this. So if you want to do that, we might have to do this. Um, so I'm a part of all of that in that discussion, which is great. Right. And the designers are the same designers from, you know, from the Broadway show. Right. So we right. already right. know each other. We work well together. We, you know, mesh really well. Yeah. Um, so I do that. And right now I'm also right now, um, preparing for the international companies. Um, and they've already been announced. Um, um, unfortunately, since COVID-19, we had to push a lot of it till next year, but sure. they're still happening. Um, but right now it's uh, Australia, followed by Germany, followed by London, followed by Tokyo. So wow. right now between September of this year, right now, because that's our first up is Australia. And as we know, Australia is doing very well with yeah, yeah. with the COVID. So we are actually in the middle of uh, September, I should be flying to Australia. So between mid-September through early June of next year, I will be putting together those four productions. No, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> that, that doesn't sound like hardly any responsibility. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, so basically I'm in, you know, I'm with the technical part. Um, the PSM does, you know, uh, actually do the teching of it and I'm overseeing. Mm -hmm. So sure. I'm helping uh, he or she, whoever to actually with their call script, where the cues go, you know, I give notes on where things should land. I'm the person that's running back and forth up uh, on stage, you know, with the crew saying that was a little slower. Can you bring that in more? Okay, let's stop for safety. Let's take this step by step. You know, I'm at the production meetings, you know, you know, since I have the entire show in my head, since I've right. done it, basically, <laughs> I'm the I'm the dictionary, I'm the encyclopedia <laughs> there for everyone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, I've I've got a couple of specific frozen questions that I want to get to in in a little bit, um, okay. because because the paperwork that you sent was so cool, and I think it's I, I think that's something that we want to share with with viewers. Um, but I but I want to talk a little bit about in in pre production more generally, and and once you're contracted to do a show, right? So you said with Frozen, you were hired, you know, a year or so in advance right. um, from, from the position of, of being a PSM Yes. and you go into, so, so are you at all? I guess my question is to what level are you typically involved with casting? With casting? Yeah. No, nah. not at all. I'm not involved with casting so at all. You don't meet the cast until they, until you guys show up for the first day of rehearsal. How does that work? Um, I and meet the cast probably. now, of course, through email and phone calls because sure. we get like two weeks, you know, pre-production before we actually see the cast. So I'm already in conversations with them, you know, getting their, all their contact information, you know, setting up fittings for them, you know, wick calls for them and all that and giving them the schedule. So, but I physically meet the cast on the first day of rehearsal. Got it. Okay. Because I'm not involved with actually casting the show. 
Got it. Yeah. Um, and so, so your first responsibilities do do the responsibilities of a PSM differ uh, between if you're starting mounting a new show like Rocky or Frozen, or if you're joining an existing show, you know, a stage manager goes on to something else and you jump into, you know, Hello Dolly right. or whatever. I mean, right. are, are, are the jobs fundamentally or is the approach fundamentally different between well, yes. new and jumping in? Yes, they, yeah, I've done both. So yes, because when I did The Color Purple, I was not there at the very beginning. I joined uh, a year after, I think it was, mm, or was it eight months, something like that after it started. Mm -hmm. So yes, when you when um, you're at the beginning before a show actually happens, you know you're a part of that process. Um, um, like I said, you know with the with you know scheduling the fittings, um, knowing what the ground plans because you have to tape out the floor. Um, you, you know you're creating the prop list. You're creating the elements list. Mm -hmm. um, you're also creating how the off stage, the deck is going to happen, you know, how it's going to move, what's going to happen backstage, the flow of backstage. Um, so you're doing all that in production to have the show actually happen. Right. You know, um, you're creating the call script, you're creating the blocking, you know, um, you're dealing with the script changes. You know, so all that's yeah, happening. Yeah, especially on a new, show. right? Especially so, on a new show, right? Because right. it changes every day. Songs move between acts; they disappear, they pop back up again. <laughs> so if you're joining a show that's already existing, you're not part of, you know, the the the, the ground plans of laying out the show. You know, right. you're learning right. what's already in existence. Sure. You know, so so it is a difference. So now when you're mounting a new show and you're, so you're in the rehearsal halls uh, yes. and, and there are, you've got other stage managers with you and everybody has their thing that they're working on. Um, what is it uh, for, for, for our viewers who have never been in a Broadway rehearsal hall? What's a, what's a typical day? Like, like say it's a dance rehearsal okay. from, from, from sort of like everybody gets there to, okay, we're done. What is, what does that look like? Um, well, what you said was correct. You know, you know, you have a team with you. I mean, and, I, and again, I'm talking on a big scale. Sure. Um, Frozen, we have four stage managers on that show. And yes, um, I like my team to know everything, but pick, you have something that you are specifically responsible for. Okay. Right. But when we gather at the end of the day, at the beginning, we all feed each other what we've done. So we all know what everybody's doing. Right. right. Um, but you know, a dance rehearsal, you know, you know, from the night before what you're going to do that day. Cause usually you have a meeting at the end of the day with the choreographer and the director to see how the day went and what we, what are we going to do the next day? Can mm -hmm. we keep on schedule? Right. Um, so for a dance, you'll know what they're going to be working on. And then what do you say? Okay. Do we have rehearsal costumes? What are they going to need? You already have that list. You already had the stuff in the room, in the building. But now you know what are they going to be putting on the skirts? Get those out of that hallway, bring them in here so they're ready to go tomorrow. Um, what props are we going to need for what they're going to do? If it's a scene like in Frozen for Huga, massive props. There are branches, there are mugs, you know, get all that ready in the room so we are prepared for that tomorrow. Um, what scenic elements are, gonna, are we going to need? Have that ready in the room, prepared for tomorrow, because you want to be ready to go on the next day. Yeah, yeah. So you have all that information with you the night before the choreographer, the director, the musical director leaves. So you know what to come in and prepare for. And when the cast comes in, you know, a lot of them will come in early. You know, if we can have the studio open so they can come and warm up beforehand, mm -hmm. you know, they're signing in, you know, sometimes it's a coffee set up, you know, you know, and my thing is, and people that work for me, I love what I do and I want to make sure it stays that way. I know it's a job, but it's a job I love. Right. So it's going to be an atmosphere that everybody wants to come to. That's you awesome. know, and I'm going to make sure that's the way it feels. Yeah. 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 You know, um, so, you know, and then we're, you know, the dance, even though um, it might not be uh, actually some of the dance things we do, we still have to take blocking. I'm not taking the choreography, but there might, I, and what I am doing is I'm going, how many people entered from stage left and from what wing? Because I'm going to need to know that when I go into tech, you know? Right, so I might right. not be doing the choreography, but I am looking at what the dancers are doing. And I might say, okay, in this section of the song, there was a group, you know, 
that did this number. It started from here to there. Okay, now this section only has a duet. Okay. Oh, I hear this in the music. This is going to be a, you know, a, a bump cue. Okay, what does that look like? I write that down because, again, I'm preparing for when I get to tech because right. a lot of right. things happen that the <laughs> lighting designer wants to know and you get all that information from the right. rehearsal. I am, uh, I am, yes. <laughs> the lighting designer wants to know all of that. <laughs> they manage a theist. Uh, you need them. Well, I have to tell you, it's the the um I I've always I mean from my perspective as an LD and and you and I talked a little bit about this uh yesterday that I tend to think of the stage manager as as once we get truly into tech probably my closest collaborator because yes. they're my eyes and ears once yes. I leave the show for all of the the high school and college students that are out there once designers are done with the show, we're gone. We're on to the next show. And we don't right. come back until somebody wants to do a tour or, you know, whatever. Right. Um, so that the the creative integrity of of your design rests in the hands of the stage manager and it, key members of the crew that the stage manager deals with. And yes. so I, 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 it's probably no mistake that four of my closest friends are stage managers, <laughs> just because they, I guess that's a personality type that I'm drawn to and I get along with, mm -hmm. but the, the function is to, to me is just so important from a, you know, we, we think of it as, as, as a practical role, but there's also a, a create that like a truly creative side to yes. it where, because you're looking at everything. You're the only one who has eyes on the entire show. You're right. You're absolutely right. I mean, I can be calling a show and I can call a cue and I will know if the person that's pushing the button was a little delayed. <laughs> <laughs> or I might know if they jumped before I said the actual go. <laughs> know if that actor is out of their special right <laughs> a little bit more you know and i have to give that note because that light is not gonna move we created that light over you because that's where you were supposed to be standing <laughs> So you I, have to know those things. I have probably four actor friends that are the absolute best at staying just on the edge yes. of the light. I was like, <laughs> you want to be on stage. You want to be seen, right? Yes. So yes. one step to the right and yes. you're beautiful. <laughs> and you know what? That, you know, your knowledge of that comes in handy because when you do understudy rehearsal or replacement, oh. those people, you know, they, they weren't on the stage when those things were being created on that actor or dancer or singer when the lighting designer was doing that. Sure. So you have to know that because when you put those people in, that person that's coming in might want to, I feel like going over here, it feels better. I'm like, well, you're gonna be in the darkness. Because <laughs> that's, I'm sorry, you're gonna have to learn how to use that creativity and make it your own over here. Right. <laughs> it might feel better, but it's also going to feel dim once exactly. you get over there. <laughs> exactly. So you have to know all of that. Yes. <laughs> All right. So I wanted to, so there's uh, two things that, uh, that uh, you had shared with us that I want to take a look at. And the first one is the, it's the, the running order from frozen. Okay. So, so tell me a little bit in what, what you use this document for and, and the, the, how valuable it can become uh, later on once you get into tech. Yes. Um, I like to use this format because if you look at it, it, um, it has a, side that says section length and time in running, which means I have a stopwatch going. So when the show starts, I let the stopwatch just keep going. And anytime I switch scenes or get to a song, I look at the watch and then I write that number down. So it tells me where in the show something is going to happen. And then the other section gives me the length of each section. And the reason that's valuable, um, the running, to be very honest, because like I said, I like a very calm and together and happy. And I think that also includes my crew knowing and feel and knowing what's going on all the time and know and for me to know how much work they have to do, too. And this might sound like, really, that's minor, but it's a big thing. But to know that running time when you go into tech is because you'll have, you know, your crew, they don't know the show as well as you. So they might turn to you and go. How much time do I have?
before I have to set this piece. And right. I said, that piece will come in 15 minutes once that show starts. So they know how much time they have. Or I'll say, um, well, those props have to be ready because when that actor walks off stage and you have to hand it to them, that is going to happen 12 minutes into the show. So they know, okay, they can figure out somewhere around that. Or the time length of a number is because sometimes somebody has to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and a good person will say, how much time do I have? And I go, those next two songs, you got 10 minutes. <laughs> Right? I mean, really. there are practical considerations really, after all. Would you, know, would you know why that's important? Because you just did a huge favor for that crew person who is now your friend. <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm saying? Those little right. things really yeah. matter. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that sheet is really good for that. It also helps the director in knowing the length of each section and go, well, that's too long. I need to tighten that up. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, and just knowing where things fall in the show. Because when you're running the show, sometimes things happen. You'll know how much time you have, where it's supposed to fall. You know, if, God forbid, somebody doesn't feel well and they had an actor. You know, you get another stage manager saying, my actor is not feeling well, they need to run to the bathroom. And I go, well, they're not on again until da-da-da-da-da. So they have this first, keep asking them, see how they're doing, tell the cover they might be going on so they can start. They know where it falls into the show. Yeah, I mean, that document, every show I do, that document is created. Got it. So the, and then the other one that uh, that I was looking at was the uh, entrance and exit breakdown. Woo! Okay. Now this one, I I, I, yeah. I I wanted people to see the just sort of the scale of this. This this is one of a number of pages. Just so our viewers yes. know. Yes. <laughs> so what do you, what is it you use this for? Okay. This document is very important because this document actually goes to quite a few people departments. The hair department likes this. The costume department likes this. The makeup department likes this. Um, and it's because um, you see where the actor, the actual person, and then you also have their character name. Mm -hmm. It gives where they enter at what time and in what scene. It also tells you where they exit. Do they enter right, left, you know, right one, wing, uh, right wing run or, and they exit left, upstage left three. Yeah. Um, it also will tell you if they are picking up a prop at that time, or if they're taking off a prop at that time. Um, it's telling you for the costume and the wig, they need to know where someone's gonna exit just in case there's a quick change, or whether or not mm -hmm. they have to do a wig, you know, a wig change, a costume right. change. It also will tell you how long a costume change or wig change is. So they know whether or not it's a quick change. Because remember, again, those departments aren't with you in the rehearsal. Right. And you can right. be in the rehearsal period from four to five weeks. But when you go to tech, you might have between 10 and 14 days to tech. So that information is very valuable for the people that don't know the show that have to learn it really fast. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, well that's that that's it's one of the other funny things that that um I think we were talking with with Natasha Katz when she was on was that there's you know the the uh, the there are a number of people who have spent four or five, six weeks in a rehearsal hall. Right. And then you get into a theater and there's a whole new bunch of people that are trying to learn everything that took six weeks in Correct. seven days. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. So, right. so I can see where that would be tremendously beneficial. And and so that's something that you guys are creating throughout and distributing to all of those departments so that they're Correct. getting all of that information. Right. And that sheet is started... I usually wait a couple of days because it's still like the choreographer and the director are figuring things out. Mm -hmm. But once I can see that they kind of really know and what's happening, then we start that sheet and it is revised constantly, constantly <laughs> before we hand it over. But sometimes when we hand it over, the departments also know that they might be getting it three days before we're out of the studio, which means something still could change. You oh, know? sure. But sure. at least it gives them a jump. It gives them a jump start before we enter the theater, they've gotten this document. Got it. Well, alrighty. So we want to expand this conversation a little bit. So okay. I would love to bring in uh, a student and an educator. So our student joining us is Bronwyn. Welcome. Hi. Hi, Bronwyn. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Excellent. Welcome. And so Bronwyn, do you have a question for Lisa Dawn? 
Uh, let's see. What is the most important piece of advice that you have for someone looking to go into stage management on Broadway? Let's see. Well, actually, not just on Broadway, but just in, in for stage management in general. It's a lot of responsibility. So know that you're going to have a lot of responsibility. Uh, be very flexible because ch things change constantly and you have to be able to go with the flow of that change and your mind going that quick for, you know, with that change. Um, I always tell people to hopefully come in with a very calming attitude because we are the people in the room, I would say, that keeps a level head. You're going to have different egos from your creative team. You're going to have different egos from your actors, right? Um, but I always say stage management team, know assured that you know what you're doing, what you need to do, and that that production cannot happen without you, okay? So you can keep the calmness in the room. When everybody else is freaking out about something, take a breath, figure out what's going on, pull everybody back in, and let's keep going. Okay, so those are the qualities, I would say. Awesome. So let's uh, let's go ahead and add in David, our educator from Michigan. Hey, David. Hi, guys. How you doing? Hey. Outstanding. Excellent. What have you got for Lisa Dawn today? Oh, I've got like, you know, a list of 40 questions. So <laughs> let me start with number one. Um, no. So, you know, one of the things you were talking about interviewing stage managers, and I'm curious, what are your questions that you ask? Because I think that leads to what qualities you're looking for. Right. So when you're interviewing um, SMs, what, what, are, what are the questions you ask them? Um, a lot of times I will ask them, I try to find out the calming thing. <laughs> I will say, what do you think your position, what do you think your job is when you're in a room um, and the director basically is having a little like, you know, uh, Fit. not really sure how he wants to work something out, you know? So he's getting frustrated or she's getting frustrated about this, right? Um, I say, how do you handle that? You know, because you can see the actors also, now they're getting all like this. How do you handle that? Um, and I like to see which way they go, how they would answer that question. You know, knowing that they shouldn't fall into that with, the director or into that feeling, but they're there to bring it back down. Let's get back to work. We can figure this out. Whatever you need, I can help you out. What, what, what do you think the problem is? You know? Um, so that's, that's one of the things. Um, I do ask uh, people about their uh, paperwork skills, of course, um, uh, about their computer skills, because now everything of course is computer and that paperwork you saw. Um, I ask people about um, their script, uh, skills because a lot of times when you're putting together a big show from the beginning, there's a lot of script changes. Sometimes the author has an assistant, sometimes they don't. So it's good to know if they have those kind of qualities. You know, you ask about their past experiences and how they, you know, and I ask them, what can you tell me was something that was very difficult and how did you handle it? Give me a story. You know, I'll ask about that. Um, and just by talking, you know, I can sometimes feel out how people are. You know, one of my other biggest, biggest things I always say to folks also is, oh, I ask them, I said, you know, if you go into somewhere and um, they give you a contract and you look at it and it's something more you want and you ask for that, but you don't get it and you still take the job, I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear any complaining that I didn't get that, so... And I don't want you not to, you know, to take and say, I'm not going to do something because you should have gave me that in order for me to do this. Because once you make the decision to take that job, take then you should put your whole heart in and do that job. The things you didn't get that you want work on outside of that, meaning how can I work that differently on that next gig? You know, how can I bring that to the table next time and figure that out? But right now, we're going to do this gig and this job to the best of our ability. And we're going to be all in it. Terrific. Okay, that might be my favorite quote ever. <laughs> we're going to be all in it. I love that that mentality of, 
Yeah, because because I, I, I think many of us get to that point where it's it's like, oh, well, you know, I'm going to take this job and it's not everything I wanted, but, you know, and then you feel like, oh, I'm just, I can just phone it in. It's like, no, 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 you, you, you did say yes. I mean, after all, you did sign up. So... <laughs> Right. Do uh so so since we've got both of you here right now, do either of you have uh, any additional questions for Lisa Don? Um, what is something that you wish that your teenage self or past self had known before pursuing stage management professionally? You know, I've been asked that question before, and I people. <clears throat> um, I personally can't say that when I go back to my teenage self, what would I have known? Because still to this day, I'm still learning. You know, I'm still learning every new show I get, every new person I meet, every new director I meet or designer, you know, actor, I'm still learning. And I want to continually learn as my process. So can't answer that question yet because I haven't done everything yet. <laughs> How about you, David? Well, I'm curious. So you've obviously worked with a number of directors. So what are the qualities that you look for in the directors? Um, and I think that probably is for everyone that you work with, but what are the things that you would look for in your directors? Like you make my life easier if you do these things. Um, respect. Um, unfortunately, um, there are a lot of folks that think the stage management team is the people that you as that you can throw up all over. They all there, you know. And I'd say Casey just said he knows the importance of us, but some people don't. They feel that you know those are the people we'll blame them for our or we can treat them like this or you know we'll work them to death. You know, um, I I demand respect. And um, I've had to, and I, you know, maybe it's because in the position I am in now, I'm able to do it, but um, I would like to think, because I have done it even when I wasn't in this position, but um, I have taken, and I won't say who and what show, but I have <laughs> had a director who um, would like really feel in a production meeting that they could blame things on myself and my team, that he or she clearly knew that I sent that paperwork to the department. I clearly had that conversation, but yet in a production meeting, something wasn't happening. And they're like, well, why didn't they get that? Well, why, and you know, stuff like that. Um, or that same person did not feel it was, uh, did they needed to learn my team's names. Um, so, That's disrespectful. Right, and, and I made <laughs> oh. point, but I wasn't gonna take it anymore. And I went to the people that actually recommended me for the job. It wasn't the director. It happened to be the author and the composer who actually um, uh, recommended me for the job because I had worked with them before. And I actually pulled those two people aside and told them that I was not happy, how I was being treated, and it has to change or I'm leaving. And uh, they said, okay, because they knew me and they knew, like I said, the kind of room I like for everyone, for everyone. And um, they arranged for myself, the director, and them to have a breakfast. And we had a breakfast. And I, and I know the director had no idea that it was going to be that kind of breakfast. <laughs> but, you know, it was kind of like, so how's it going? And I said, not good. And I basically, I was very respectful, though, because I will be. You know, even when you have something you have to say to someone um, that might be hard, you still should be respectful. And I did. I just said to this person that, uh, you know, I don't feel the room is going very well. And I think it's because of you, because this is how you speak to people. This is how you speak to me and my team. And I don't it's unacceptable because no one deserves to be spoken to that way. And that person was taken back. But I have to say that person actually said to me, no one has ever spoken to me like that or said that I appreciate it. You are correct. It will change. And it did. So it's respect. That's what I, I, that's what comes off of me when I'm in a room and what I get back. And now it seems that's, that's what, that's what is in the room for me is respect. Do you know, you, you mentioned about creating this space that 
everyone feels good and even though it's a job, but is that then what you are pushing out to create that space to them, the respect of everyone in the room? I mean, what I guess what I was curious about is how do you, what are you doing to create this space that, that makes it a place that people want to go to even though it's a job? Okay. Um, again, this might seem little, little things, but think joyous things like when the cast comes in and they have to sign the call board, you know, the name that they're here, I have a very fun call board. I do. I have a theme, you know? It's the first thing that they're going to see. So make it, you know, make it lively, make it something, you know? You know, I'm very much, you know, even though my I don't have my team take it on, but I have it where the whole cast takes it on, our birthdays, you know? But we all do it together. It's not like the stage manager's responsibility. Everybody, it's your birthday, and then after yours, you have to get the cake for the next, and then you have to get the cake for the next. That's how we do it. We celebrate birthdays, you know? And even if, the, and you don't have to get the company to pay for it, you do it with yourselves. The company pays, this is how we do it. Company pays for the first cake, and then everybody else pays for the next person, and the next person, and the next person. Oh. It's a family thing, you know? We have potluck. I'm very good with potluck. Let's have a potluck, you know? <laughs> Everybody bring your favorite food, you know, once every two months. You know, anything to make it like you want to come into work. I'm also respectful where my door is always open in the office, always open. But everybody knows, because I say this on the first day, my door is always open. You can come in. You can have any conversation with me about the show, anything. It's fine. I said, but please, you are responsible for the energy you bring into the room. Okay. Know that before you come into the room. And also know that I'm going to tell you the truth when you come into the room. So if it has something to do with the show or a union rule or something like that, I'm going to tell you the truth. It might not be something you want to hear, but it's going to be respectful and it's going to be the truth. And I'm telling you, when you put that out there and you treat everyone that way and they know that, and they also know that I actually care about the space that everyone's in. I am safety like crazy. I will I will stop in a tech. Even if a director wants to blow, plow through, and I have done it. I have said to a director, I totally understand you want to continue this. I said, but right now, I guarantee you, in the long run, this will pay off. It might look like we're going slow, but we need to take the time to do this. And we do. So people can see I care about them. Well, hopefully they start caring about each other. And that goes with everyone. That goes with the director, the choreographer, the designers, the general managers, the producers that have said, this is your responsibility. You know, my team, that's, that's the stuff that I do. Thank you. Yeah. That's great. Okay, so we're gonna see you guys in uh, towards the end of the show. So thank you. And we will come Thanks. back to you in just a little bit, okay? Sounds good. All right. So, oh my gosh, so, so, so much good stuff in there. So the, the, one of the things that, you know, you get into these technically complex shows, right. And the, uh, the, it, it seems like you know, the, the story that I've told with, with some high school students is because most everyone is familiar with the idea of a tech week. And when you're talking about a Broadway show, that's tech weeks. You know, when you're talking yeah. about some of these large, spectacular type production, it's tech months sometimes. <laughs> and because once once you start getting into these very complex show systems, you have to start breaking it down into much smaller steps. And I think it's I I I think that there are a lot of times that it does seem. I agree with you that that you know where the progress is slowing down or we're taking 10 steps back or oh my gosh why won't the thing go downstage when we need the thing to go downstage <laughs> um, but the the thing that's it's just super important to stop in those moments and like you said just be respectful and say you know what this is this is what we need to do we're protecting we're protecting the actors we're protecting the crew everybody has to learn because because this thing whatever it is is going to break one day it's 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 going to break in the middle of a performance, and we all need to know what to do. <laughs> um, so I, I I I think I think approaching those types of situations from that place of just openness and and yeah. 
diplomatic yes. awareness and respect is, is super important. Yes. Um, okay, so I wanna talk a little bit about, you know, we spent a little time in the rehearsal hall and now we're transitioning to uh, the theater. So when you're mounting a new show, like say when you were mounting Frozen, do you uh, get the opportunity to go into the theater at any time prior? And is that, and, and, and what is that for? For because because I I think there are a lot of like our, our our high school and college student watchers you know they 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 build the set on the stage that they're going to perform it on yes. and you're rehearsing on the stage you're going to perform on so breaking things up between the rehearsal hall and then actually loading into a theater for real is 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 a concept right. that it takes some people a little bit to learn so right. what is it like for when you get to go into the theater prior to load in and then what is your load in like yeah. Um, so prior to Lone, I always like to go by the theater, like you said mm -hmm. early. And it's because I always find even though you can be so, you know, meticulous with your ground plan that, that someone is, you know, that the set designer or the associate designer has given you, it's nothing like when you actually are in the space. Sure. So yeah. though we've taped out the floor and we are rehearsing in that space, it's always great to go into the space and actually see how wide that wing feels. Okay. It's actually great to see how much space is actually stage left and stage right, or how much space is upstage. Um, what are the crossovers like to actually be in that space and see what that is? You know, if there's not a crossover at that time, sometimes I will time, I will go to a theater and I will time if there's not a crossover, but the choreographer or the director has said, they're going to enter from here, but they're going to exit, you know, on the other side. But then I want them to come back on the other side and they only have how much time can that work? I will have a timer and I will have, you know, the, the song, you know, uh, on a tape mm -hmm. and I will start it. They exit it here at time. And then I will do a trail, go down. If it's downstairs, you know, <laughs> through everything, come back up and go, OK, it took that long to do that. They have that much time. If it's a quick change, the same thing. Do they have to quick change upstage? Let me time it here because they have to go back to their dressing room maybe to do it, or they have to go to the bunker to do it, or they have to go downstairs to the wig room. So to actually be in the space, you know, I do all that stuff, and then I take it back to the rehearsal room and go, okay, that can happen, or you're going to really be tight in that. It might be better if there's somehow you can have them exit the other way so they can come back on that way because they're not going to make it. Yeah, you know, yeah. So those kind of things are great to get into the theater ahead of time. And space wise, you can say, you know what, I know it says this on on the ground plan that it's six feet wide, but in the theater it's actually five foot six inches and those six inches make a difference. You know that. They right? can. Oh, my gosh. It's crazy. So, you know, just going in and knowing that. So now you go back to the rehearsal. So, you know what, we really don't have that much space as we thought. Yeah. So let's, you know, or and then when stuff starts getting loaded in, that changes it again. I go in, you know, when stuff is loaded in just to see when pieces are flying in, how much space is really there. Because in, yeah. the, in the rehearsal hall, you don't have a piece that flies in, you put a piece of tape across the floor and say, that's where the drop lands. Right. <laughs> now you've gotten into the space and you didn't realize that they should have drawn that that drop is six inches wide yeah. and <laughs> or, or, or a foot wide, you know? Oh, right, and you didn't right, have that because right. you had a piece of tape going across the floor. <laughs> you know, so that's why for me, I always go into the theater multiple times once they start loading in, just gotcha. to see the process, how things are happening, how things are coming in, um, you know, how things are put into the floor. I, you know, I think that all just gives you more information. You know, you don't have to know the job of the carpenter or the job of the electrician or the job of the engineer. <laughs> that's not that's their expertise. Sure. But sure, just sure. to know and see the things you can pick up that will be very useful for you. Well, and well, yeah, and it all goes back to what you were saying, saying sort of having that encyclopedic, that encyclopedic knowledge of something like Frozen, Frozen where you've gone, gone through, through since the beginning yes. and and lived through, oh, no, no, when we did this, you know, this was six inches off of where it was supposed to be, or it was a yeah. foot deeper, or, you know, and this is what we learned. And, and, and yes. other people have the opportunity to benefit from the knowledge that you've gleaned on the project thus far. I love that. Correct, correct. Okay, so now your actual load in, is that just like you go into the theater and sit down at the desk and you're done? I mean, what is what does that uh, look well, like for you personally? No, but, um, <laughs> you know, um, the, my, my desk, my tech desk when I'm for teching, um, I've already talked to the technical supervisor and said, 
how wide I like it, how long I like it, how much equipment has to be put on it. Mm -hmm. um, I tell them how I like my, you know, cue lights set up. I tell them where I want my monitors, where I want the, you know, the color monitor, the infrared monitor, the conductor monitor. I have a, certain placements I like things. Mm -hmm. um, I have a certain, there's a certain thing that I really like that I, I say I have to have. A lot of times um, when people call a show, um, they have the script on the desk and they have their cue lights above them, which means um, they have to look down at their script when they're doing stuff, which means it takes their focus off of their monitors. Sure. I've reversed that. My cue lights are sunk into a desk and my script is high up. And then my other monitors are placed up like this. So I never have to look down at my script. My script is right there. But yeah, yeah. again, as a dancer, I choreograph my fingers. So I know auto, you know, that my auto deck lights are here, my auto fly lights are here, my rail lights are here, my conductor light is here, my sound light is here. So if I have multiple things, once I look and put my fingers, I know where they move next, you know? Yeah. But I don't like taking my eye off the script too far from my monitors sure, to know sure. what I am doing. Because I have a quicker eye to look at the cue lights like that quick, because I can just look at them by a second. But if my actual script is down, I might have to, you know, read, uh, um, I don't know how many cues at one time. And if they're right. below me, I can't see what's happening on the monitor and if everything is working. <laughs> so I reverse that and I tell them that this is what I need. I also demand, <laughs> I mean, remember, I am running the ship in there. So I think you want me comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> so I also ask for a certain chair because my back, if, if you have to sit on one of those, what we call butt, 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 butt boards. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Your back, right. You know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you're leaning in. And I did that too long. I did that a lot before I realized this is not going to work. Yeah. So I asked them, you need to take out some chairs here. I know it's going to cost, but you need to take out some chairs here. And I need my, my chair here. <laughs> and I need to be able to go in and out there. You know, I mean, again, even though I want to make the room comfortable for everyone, and secure, safe, uplifting, calm, happy. I also have to feel that too. Sure, sure. You know, especially if I'm in in that chair operating this whole place. You know, well, so and, those and are the it, things. Right, because what, I mean, what we're talking about is arguably the part of the process that is the maybe the most susceptible to change. Uh, that 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 creeps out and affects all other departments. You know, it's like cha changing blocking in a rehearsal studio is one thing. Changing it after you've gotten into uh, uh, on the stage is another thing. And there, are, once you start dealing with things like automation and 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 you know, randomly. The director decides they want to cut a song. You know, right. once you're well deep into rehearsals, it's like right. so. So creating that environment where everyone feels a safe, most importantly, but b comfortable. Yeah, and not not you know not we're all sitting on a cruise ship luxuriating. Right. But, right. but the reality is, you're spending very long days <laughs> for right. a number of weeks in a in in a environment that could potentially be very tense and yes. and occasionally problematic yes. and I, I don't think that's unreasonable at all my gosh i'm i'm adding uh get a new chair to my rider <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. okay so i wanted to talk to you uh so i want to go uh, back a little bit to frozen and talk about two specific documents um because i think they're uh, a really great insight and i'm i'm curious about uh, so the one i want to talk uh, ask you about first of all is the master uh the automation yeah. cues so um for our viewers the, again this is a small sampling of the, <laughs> this particular document and so uh, i have two questions for you about this number one the, is is this something that uh, you start creating earlier in the process and continue doing throughout, or do you wait until you're in the space to actually do this with with the technical gear? Okay, this is done before I go into tech. Okay. 
uh, is not done at the first beginning of rehearsal because we don't really know. Um, because during the rehearsal part is when you know when something's coming on, where it's coming on from. The director will be telling you at the time, I wanted to come in at this part of the song or during um, when they say this line and I wanted to land by here. So you're, I, I am writing all that in my script. I have a couple of scripts. I have a blocking script, you know, and then I have a script that has these different cues in it where I'm writing on there saying, you know, the, the bench is coming in from left one around this cue line, but it has to land by this point. So when, or if a song happens, you know, uh, this piece is coming on at this bar and it's going to have to land at this time. So then I, on my own, I'm backtracking. How long did that take? So I write that down. So then when I start creating this document, this document, I usually say, say it's a four week rehearsal process, yeah. right? And then dry tech usually happens within the fourth week, which means I actually leave the rehearsal room and go and start doing dry tech. So usually by the uh, beginning of my third week, is when I'm actually starting to take out what I've been writing in my book and start making this sheet and start putting in, you know, what I need. Uh, it, it has the scenes in it. It has the page number so I can go right to the page where it started. Um, it has the elements, whether or not it's, you know, a prop handoff is on that sheet. You know, when something flies in is on that sheet. Automation is on that sheet. Mm -hmm. um, special effects is on that sheet. Um, if things are supposed to happen. Um, so I start creating that within my book and then I start putting it into format on those pages. Because again, those pages want to be sent to the technical supervisor so he can start handing it out to the head carpenter, the head electrician, so they can start looking at it before I get into dry tech. So they have an idea of trying to prepare what they can just by looking at that. So when I walk in, it's not just totally done right at the, right that point. They've okay. already had a starting process because I've given them a lot of information. And that's what that's for. Got it, got it, got it, okay. So, and then the, the next one is your actual call script. So <laughs> I, I cherry picked a few pages from this. And the reason that I did was because Basically, on the on the first page, you can see the arrow there in the lower right corner. So that's obviously you're prepping for something that's happening on the next page, right? And yes, you're telling you're saying you got to turn that page real fast, <laughs> right? Yes, yes. Um, so, uh, so your as you're going through and creating your call script, how how detailed and like, I guess to what level of detail, what's the right amount of information in a call script? Well, for me, um, I like colors. I like the colors, you know, um, because, you know, you have your red, blue, yellow, green, you know, your lights. So that's on there. It focuses, focuses you on where you need to go, um, mm -hmm. first off. Um, I like a certain order of where uh, the lights I like in what department. If it's a heavy automation show, I like auto deck, auto fly, manual rail, you know, I go down the line. That's mm -hmm. how I set it up. Um, the call script, um, what I like is when I'm giving warnings, meaning standbys to prep for when they're actually going to be executed. Um, I like to have what the actual cue is doing written there. It might be very tiny, but it's big enough for me to see because when you're saying, you know, standby uh, auto deck 34 on the red, you need to know what that is actually going to do. Right. So if you look at my script, you'll see it's kind of small, but it'll say what that is going to actually do. So, you know, and then when you execute it, I also have it there. So when I go to that next page and I throw that light and I'm looking at the screen, I know exactly what that cue is supposed to be doing. I also put little, little hints in my book. If there's something that I'm supposed to visually see to, an order to execute something and it's not a line and it's not mm -hmm. something in the song, it's yeah, a yeah. visual. I might have little eyeglasses, you know, I don't know if you got a page that has it. I might have little eyeglasses there to show you were supposed to look on the screen for that. Got it. Okay. Just ahead, you know, <laughs> um, so stuff like that, you just give yourself and that little arrow basically says you have to turn the page really quick because when you saw all those things I have to stand by, that's a lot to put in my mouth. 
And by the time I finish, I have to be able to do that cue coming up. Sure, so those sure. arrows give me hints. You have to turn that page really quick. You know, uh, something is really coming up fast. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, you give yourself that. Cool. All right. So I have, we have, we have two more guests that I want to, to join us. I'm going to switch up the order here a little bit. I'm going to bring in our teacher first, uh, Fatima from Australia. Hi. Hey there. Hey. So hey. The reason that I wanted to bring her on is because she's got a question specifically about a sequence in Frozen. So Fatima, go for it. Uh -oh. Thanks. Uh, for starters, I'd like to say you're absolutely amazing. And oh. some of the things that you've been saying, is I've been writing all the notes down because it's answered a lot of my questions. But the big one I have is actually from the final scene of Act 1, the Let It Go sequence, uh -huh. uh, which is an amazing sequence in the when I saw it. Um, on Broadway, from the beginning with the glove and the cup into the hand gestures with the projection. Now, this question is specifically about the projections, because okay. how I notice that the hands actually, it looks like it's actually initiating all of those projections. So is that sequence completely on time coding, or are yes. you actually watching? Oh, good. Yes. <laughs> so yes. now the next part of that question, because I was thinking, how on earth is that going to happen? On uh, at rehearsal, do you have all of? Is that entire projection mapping done before uh, while you're actually in the rehearsal space, or is it actually as evolves as you go through? Well, actually, what we do is the choreographer created it in the rehearsal space, um, and what we do is the uh, video designer will come in and watch uh, some rehearsals, especially if it has to do with video. That's specific to what an actor or a dancer or a singer is doing. We'll have say, come on this day, we're rehearsing that so you can see what's going on. So he'll come in and he'll take notes because the choreographer and the director will say, I want her to look like she's making that on the screen. I want her to, and so, and then he gets the music and he hears it. And then on top of that, what we do is when we go into tech, I will set some time specially aside oh. just for the mm -hmm. actress mm -hmm. to be on the stage doing the movement so the video person, videographer can, uh, video designer can see it. And then mm -hmm. I also have the actress, since it was in, uh, an actress for Let It Go, come out and sit in the house with me. Mm -hmm. And I play the music and I have the video designer do the video so she can see what's happening. Because remember, it's behind her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So she can see what's happening. So then now she has it in her mind okay, I know what's happening. And then she does a little more or slower or more gestures. And now she lives with the video. Yes. In her body because yeah. I pulled her out so she could actually see what was made. So it's a collaboration actually. Yeah. Uh, no, that's fun. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. So in terms of that, because after um, – like the beginning part when it starts having all of those automations, especially with the reveals of the costume, um, being on time coding, do you? How do you prep the rest of the departments to be prepared for that sequence? Okay. Um, well, for that sequence in particular, I I've connected a lot of the cues. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in that sequence, we have drops that come in on certain times, one after another, very musically, they land on a certain music. So what I've had to do was, the first time I hit the button for the first drop to come in, I've already triggered and had the automation guy put it in the system that when that hit that point and, uh, and the automation guy has timed it and said, okay, automatically that second drop is gonna happen at this particular time, three, uh, a fraction of a second later, two seconds later, the next drop is gonna happen. The timing for that to land is going to be in about eight seconds because it has to drop at that certain time for the music. So I've mm -hmm. actually connected them. Instead of having three cue lights for three different drops, mm -hmm. I have one cue light for the first drop and the others are triggered in the automation, in the timing of it, where they automatically follow each other. Mm -hmm. So it stays in timing. Right. Okay. Yeah. And I can yep. do that, with, and I also try to do that a lot of times with the automation stuff. But in, in Let It Go is what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Those things are we actually have worked together because of the time code that we use mm -hmm. um, to actually try to put as many things that can just trigger off of one thing, rather than having to have somebody uh, manually, you know, touch something mm -hmm. every time something's supposed to happen. So that's yeah. how we do that. 
Oh, no, that's great, that one. It is a crazy uh, sequence. <laughs> oh, it's <a> brilliant sequence. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, let's go ahead and bring in Janique, who is our student, who Hi. really wants to be a stage manager. Hi. So, Janique, what is your question? Uh, so I was wondering, what is one of the um, worst situations that has happened to you during a performance? And how did you manage to not only fix the problem, but make sure that the audience, the cast, or the crew like didn't panic or freak out about it? Mm -hmm. I can give you a doozy. Um, it happened in Frozen. <laughs> um, and you know what? It's okay because what? It's live theater. So you always have to be prepared that something's going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but um, what happened was it was a sequence. It's very, very, very difficult, and it's also timed. But it's the sequence when um, Elsa leaves the castle when she's running, and she's going into the woods and turning um, everything to ice, basically going from Arendelle into the frozen world. And there's a sequence that a lot of pieces are moving. They're timed off of each other. Actors are running in and out of wings. Um, and things are opening and closing with certain timings. This has to be closed before this flies in, or this has to fly out before that opens up. And my eye is looking at everything to happen. And one night, one night, what happened was the shutters, something as simple as some shutters that were upstage didn't close completely. And I could not see that. Could not see that on the screen because we went to, you know, the lights, we went to dark, what we're supposed to. And I saw them closing. They did not complete. And just that little non-completion, the drop trot started flying out, hit something, and stopped it. And once that stopped, then something else stopped, right? So what did we do? We saw all that happen. Fabulous stage managers on stage because they're watching everything. You know, they stopped the actors from continually going on, right? Mm -hmm. I had my crew in my ear talking to me. And they were like, you know, I said, the actors aren't coming back on. We're safe. Can we keep going with the scenery or do we have to stop? They went as far as they could. And then they said, Lisa Dawn, we're going to have to stop because there's no way we can get this piece out. And we knew in order to keep going, that piece had to come out. So, what you know, it's it, live theater. So I had to stop the show. I had to make an announcement to the audience, say we have a technical difficulty. We'd be right back with you, you know. Mm -hmm. That's what we did. And, you know, usually the audience loves it because it's something for them to go home and talk about. So <laughs> guess what happened tonight? You know, and just yeah. as long as you keep them informed along the way, you know, they're fine. You know, it's going to be maybe, you know, 30 seconds. If you find that it's going to be more than like a minute and a half, you need to, you know, you talk to the house manager, you let them know what's going on. And the same time you're talking to your crew, you're talking to your crew because they're out there trying to fix things. They're trying to fix mm -hmm. things, you know. So things happened. That happened, kept the cast safe, kept them informed of what was going on, told them once we get this out and settled, this is where we're going to pick up. So that gets around to everybody. I've made announcements backstage to the wardrobe, but everybody, everybody knows what has happened. Everybody knows where we're going to start up again, if we can start up again. And we were able to. And we had a point where we could start. Crew said, okay, we got everything under control, we're fine. We were able to bring in the curtain so the audience wouldn't see everybody on stage doing something. You bring the house lights to half or a quarter so the audience is sitting in complete darkness, but you don't want to bring them full because if you bring them full, everybody's running to the bathroom. And now you got to wait for them all to come back, right? So you don't want yeah. that, you know. Um, but you know, again, you stay calm, you keep the communication going, right? And you're talking to everybody. And that's why if you're in that seat of calling the show, you have to keep keep the calm head. You have your stage manager on the deck that are in total support of you, and you know they're taking care of everybody else in the cast and the crew and giving all that information, wardrobe, hair, makeup, everybody knows what's going on. You've talked to your conductor. You've told them what's going on. They're keeping the orchestra cool. And then when it's time to start again, you make an announcement. Thank you, audience, for, for your patience. We are ready to go. Ready to go tell your, you know, your conductor where you're going to pick it up. Curtain goes out. Let's keep going. 
Thank you. Love that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're going to send you two guys away for just a little bit. Uh, we'll bring, we're going to bring everybody back in. We're going to try six of us in, uh, in the windows when we come back, maybe do a little Brady bunch. Okay. Um, <laughs> but I've got a couple more questions for, uh, for you, Lisa, before we get in, into that. So, okay. So in the introduction, um, I characterize stage managers as the, the eye of the hurricane, because I think it's, it's, it's a completely apt description. Um, uh, sort of an oasis of calm in the midst of what is sometimes complete chaos. <laughs> so um, can you, I mean, you've touched on a little bit, but can you talk a little bit about how it's possible to, how do you maintain that frame of mind, that calm when situations like you've experienced in them before grow chaotic or even tense? How, like in the moment, how do you stay calm and centered? Because right. it's a lot to juggle. It is a lot to juggle, you know, and I'm not, and, and I don't want anybody to think it's easy. It's not easy and it is a lot to juggle. Um, you know, I, I think everybody has to find their own way of how they, they deal with stress. You know, you do. Um, I myself, I meditate a lot. So I have a breathing, you know, and um, I also look at reality. You know, I never wanted to do film and TV. And the reason for that is because I didn't want the perfection. I didn't want, if something goes wrong, they go, okay, take it again. Okay, take it again. That's that just wasn't on. me. <laughs> so I wanted the live theater. I like the energy that happens there. I like what happens, you know, you get a different audience every night, you know? And so I know it's possible something can happen, you know? And that that's just, we all know that. You know, so let's not fool ourselves, you know, we all know that, you know, so sometimes, you know, and I'm not saying that inside I'm not nervous. Oh, sure. I'm not sure. saying that, you know, I'm not saying inside I'm going, we really got to get out of this or we got to figure this out or what can I do next? But it's just that whole thing of I breathe and I talk very, not slow, but I don't talk fast through something because I'm thinking as I'm talking, you know, and I, again, I bring in help, you know? I know that the carpenter is on that stage and he was in charge or is of all, you know, calling this in, calling that out, how that works. I talk to my head carpenter and I say, how long do you think that's gonna take? I trust him. Do you think you can get a little quicker? Okay, thank you. Move on to the next thing. I trust them, you know, because we have formed a communication and um, uh, a bond that we all want this to work together, you know? And they know I trust them and I will come to them and I don't look past them or over them or, you know, they're just the hell. I don't do any of that stuff. Yeah. You know, so when we get into those situations, I know who I have on my team, yeah, you know, and right. I can trust that. So that'll help. So now in these, uh, you know, there, there are a number of different, uh, uh, unions that are involved in the production of of Broadway theater and and tours and everything. Um, do you how deeply are you involved in uh, in being versed in the details of some of those contracts? And does that influence how sometimes you can approach situations? Um, yes, um, I take it upon myself. Um, first of all, I know the equity rules. Um, very well for whatever contract I'm doing. I make sure I, I know that. Mm -hmm. um, and I also even tell my actors, you know, you know, when you're sitting on the subway, read this so you'll know what you've signed on to. You, right? You did sign. <laughs> right? Know what you signed on to. Um, for the, the, the crew, I will write down the things that I know that I will encounter most. So I don't know their book totally, like I know my union book. But I will write down the things, you know, I will write down, you know, how many hours long we can go before we can break, you know, or how many hours we can go before we have to take a lunch break or a dinner break. Um, when we come back, you know, can I call Brad? Do I have to call back the entire crew? Can I just call back these guys? You know, what am I going to work? You know, I learn all that stuff. And what I do is I form those. I know those questions beforehand. I have shorthand where I have a list and I call it my cheat sheet. And I go into every production with, with my technical supervisor because I never assume because I don't follow when, you know, the, the crew has their contracts that change over. 
So what I'll do is before every production, I'll have a meeting with the technical supervisor who knows their rules. And I say, these are my questions. Can you answer all of this for me? So I have it. So when I'm preparing a schedule or when I am trying to do or, you know, or call a certain schedule for a certain scene or what I need, I, I try to know as much as what I need to know. It's the same thing for the musicians union because they're yeah, another entity. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. my wardrobe, they're another, you know, so everybody. So I try to learn what I need to learn Got in it. order for that production to happen. Got it. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. So before we bring uh, our, our students and educators back in, I've got one more uh, question for you. So, yeah, you know, we've talked uh, uh, about all the different ways that people can can become stage managers, whether it's from, from a dancer background or whatever. Um, but is there, I mean, is there like any sort of related course I, I, apart from going to school to be a stage manager that students could consider if they wanted to pursue a career is like, would it be helpful to be you know, like, take a little psychiatry, <laughs> you know, or, or, or an EMT course or, you know, because, because you guys are, are called upon to do some of the, some of the most random bizarre Mm -hmm. things especially when you're out on the road and you're you you, you have to improvise sometimes Are you, right. is, there, is there anything else that uh that you could recommend beyond the normal theater education you know i you gotta reach into your life skills you know i mean i mean i know it's it's you know i'm a little older than our youngins um so i know that but um you know your life skills help you a lot on how to deal with situations yeah um because like you said you know you you know you're in there with a, quite a lot of people you know the size of the cast the size of the crew the size of the musicians and you know the designers the creative everything um so yes you're right it's it's sometimes you know like we're mom i mean i get called that a lot to be very honest with my cast um because they say you know she's loving but she's strict you know <laughs> <laughs> she's loving i know she's gonna take care of us you know um so you know you, you you're right you know you just have to hone in on those other i would say everyday life skills that you have and see how you can bring them into your work you know to help you you know walking down the street how do you deal with a crowd of people that are coming at you in new york city you know how do you deal with being on the subway you know late at night when you're going home i mean anything you could think of i'm sure you can go hmm oh that kind of relates there Interesting. you know yeah yeah, yeah. really look at that all right well let's go ahead and bring back in our two students and our two teachers and we'll, we'll see how this goes. <laughs> so uh, you you touched on this just a tiny bit earlier, but I wanted to get us all together and ask, um, you know, b building off of David's question about the type of questions that you might ask in an interview, what are, when you take a step or two back, what are the, the qualities that you think contribute to being a, a, an excellent stage manager? Mm -hmm. Communication. That's okay. big. That is big. Um, because, um, you know, you called us like the calm and the storm and all that. I, I call the stage manager team like the hub of everything because everything funnels toward, through us. You know, the designers are coming to us with what they need and, and, and then they're coming to you with questions about the show. You know, you have the creative team coming to you for the scheduling and making sure, you know, the actors are on point of what they're doing. Um, you have the crew coming at you to learn about the show so they can put it up. You have the general managers and the producers coming at you going, what's going on? Is it going on time? Is it on schedule? You got the actors coming at you, you know, everyone. So yeah. the stage management team to me is the hub. It's the place where everything comes in and then we know where everything should go. This department, they need to know this. They need to know that. They need to know that, you know, so that's how I look at the team. You know? I, 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 don't I don't even know, know how, how you keep track of it. How I, the, the multitasking brain, it's like I can barely concentrate on one task, the one that's right in front of me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Much less a million of them and having to communicate all of that out. So I want to do a quick, uh, quick around the room. So does anybody have an additional question? Anybody? <laughs> okay. All right. So let's, uh, let's go alphabetically. Bronwyn, uh, what you got for us? Okay. 
So I know you mentioned how you were dealing with a director that wasn't doing what you like. How would you go about handling and dealing with a, a cast or crew member that's causing issues during rehearsals or productions? Okay. Um, I'm not one that calls someone out in front of everyone. I don't, I don't think that's good. Even if you do it to me, I will not do that to you because I still go back to, I want you to treat me as I treat you. Um, so I, I, will, I will actually ask to speak to that actor uh, or crew person, you know, by themselves. I might not be able to do it in the moment, depending on what we're doing. If I can do it in the moment, I will. Um, but if I can't, I will find time afterwards to just pull that person aside and just say, you know, when that happened, you know, it didn't feel too good. You know, you know, I could say, is there something going on? You know, I won't accuse or put it on them. I want to know, did, you know, something going on, something happened here. Cause if that, that just didn't work out too well with us. Or if it's something disrespectful to waste somebody talk, I will say to them, you know, when you said that, you know, that was really uncalled for, or, you know, I don't accept that, you know, because I am in charge of what I accept and what I don't. So I don't really accept that. So, you know, maybe we can have a conversation about why that happened that way or, you know, and, you know, cause we're going to have to work on this together and we're going to be together for a while. So it'd be great if we can just figure this out now so we can just keep going afterwards. But I always will take you by yourself. I will never call you out in a room if I can help it. No, I will not call you out. Of the, I don't think that should happen, you know, and if it does, if I have to do that, that's really not good because that's really a bad situation <laughs> that you got me there. <laughs> How about you, David? You said you had a question? Yeah, so you're on uh, a Broadway deserted island. You can only bring one tool with you for your <laughs> stage management kit. What are you bringing? <laughs> oh, my Lord. Mm. My measuring tape. <laughs> All right. Fair, fair. <laughs> It is the one tool I make sure is clipped to my belt. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I don't even know how you choose. Fatima, do you have any questions? Yeah, I do have one. Because, um, as I said, have, um, you're coming from a performer's pr perspective. Do you, do you find that having had that experience coming from a performer, you've actually been able to relate so much uh, closer to your cast and the crew? And do you find that they, they respect that more? They, they see you completely different instead of someone who's here as being the taskmaster, but they see you as someone who actually has a true understanding? Actually, it has benefited me, yes, mm -hmm. uh, quite well. Um, because it, it, it and, and it's not like I go in and tell everybody that I have that background, but I've been around long enough that people know that um, that I have that. And um, I have to say that some of the directors and choreographers that are on Broadway today used to be my dance partners. <laughs> so I have a relationship with them. Mm -hmm. um, I've been asked specifically by certain choreographers that, you know, they want me because they know me so well and how I work. Um, mm -hmm. So I do think it benefits. I also know, um, I think since I was on the stage for 10 years, I kind of have an insight sometimes of how somebody might be feeling at that time through that long rehearsal process or something going on. Um, yes, I can possibly relate to them a little more and have a conversation um, uh, down to earth a little more with them. And the actors seem to find out that I have that background and they do uh, are very much, you know, able to talk to me, I think a little more easy because they, they say, she understands that she actually danced, you know, in the shows I've danced in, how hard they were. So they know mm. what that process is or, you know, the musical or whatever. So, yes, it has benefited me quite, quite well. Mm -hmm. And do you recommend uh, young aspiring technicians to actually try and get that little, even that little bit of practical stage experience? Do you think it would actually help them? necessarily tell people they have to get the actual on stage um but I, I i do and if they don't i do say to themselves you know um if you can i mean it's kind of hard to put yourselves in those shoes if you haven't been mm. but um i just say you know try 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 to understand somebody else's perspective 
Mm. You know, I do. But I, I wouldn't say that, you know, if you could take some dance classes, you should do that. You know, yeah. you know, I mean, because that's a that's a long career in itself. It's not like you can mm. take two classes and go, OK, <laughs> I know how a dance appeals. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. Know? So, so, so no, it's just that with my background, it has benefit, benefited me quite a bit in my mm. career with actors with directors, with choreographers, with being able to call a show the way I do in a musical because I have that musicality in my head, mm -hmm. you know, or choreography because I know what they're actually doing, mm -hmm. you know, uh, so that helps me when I'm able to block and when I'm able to call a show because I know what the next step is because I, you know, I can see it over and over and over and go, I know what they're, you know, so. Um, <laughs> Well, yeah. and, and, and I can tell you from a, from a designer perspective, when I went to, uh, I, I went to a college on scholarship and part of the scholarship requirement was that I had to audition for shows, which was not awesome for anybody watching the shows. <laughs> so, but what I can tell you is that I don't, I don't think being on stage made me a better designer, but it, it did make me a more patient designer. That's that's for sure, especially when you get into those periods of tech when you know you're sitting there in the middle of your creative head and you've got 34 people on stage who are just like they're watching paint dry for hours and hours and hours <laughs> on end while you build cues. Yeah, it did make me more cognizant of 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 what they're going through in those moments. <laughs> right, thank you. Janique, do you have any questions for us? Yes. Um, oh. Other than like taking a power nap before a show, do you have like a pre or post show routine? Just to make sure you don't get overwhelmed. Um, um, it just depends on what's happening that day because the day can be, you know, very different. You know, um, I'll come in. I like I said, you know, my team, I try to have a good time with them. We talk about how their day was while we're preparing for the show that night. Um, if we're if, if we're going to do a show. Um, just to just be normal, you know, I go and check in with the crew, you know, I might walk around the building just to see who I bump into and have a conversation, you know, how you doing? How was your day? You know, just, you know, just to be in the space with everyone is a big thing for me. Um, and, um, but that power nap is really <laughs> good <laughs> only because it's sent, it's that to me, it centers me. It just centers me before I have to go in and call the show. That's all. Now, if I'm not calling a show that night, I don't do a power nap because I'm not, this is if I'm calling the show. If I'm not mm. calling the show, then I continue my routine of, you know, going out. I go out in front of the house. I talk to the ushers. I talk to the house manager. We're all in this together, you mm. know? So I make sure everybody knows who I am and I know who you are because we're all in this building making this happen, you know? Mm. That's awesome. Brilliant. Okay, so I want to thank our students and our educators. Thank you, Janique and Bronwyn and Fatima and David. Thank you so much for jumping in and asking questions and engaging in the conversation. It's been uh, delightful having you guys on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you so, so much. We've got a couple of viewer questions that I wanted to throw in front of you. Uh oh. Um, one is uh, from Brian, and Brian asks, how do you feel about digital call books as opposed to a paper call book? <laughs> nope, not for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, no, not for me, really. Um, okay, I yeah. had one show where I was the first assistant on, and it was the first time that that PSM uh, called from uh, his uh, computer. Mm -hmm. He checked the show from his computer. You know, when you're doing it for you, fine. You know, you got to create the show for you. Um, and he was calling the show from that. And I clearly went up to him. I said, there's no way when I start calling the show, I'm calling from a computer because I just, it, that would make me nervous. That would make me nervous that the yeah. power's going to go out, the screen's going to go out, the screen's going to freeze, anything. <laughs> right. If it's, a, if it's a paper book, it's me turning the page. There it is. Done. <laughs> Nothing else. No. So, um, but I know some people are doing that now and if they, they're comfortable with that more power to them, but it's not for me. Got it. Okay. So this next one, uh, relates a little bit back to it's, it's, it's kind of a couple questions in once it's, it's one of mine thrown in with a viewer question. Okay. So you talked earlier about Q lights yes. and, um, I know that there are a number of stage managers that, 
prefer calling the show from backstage and there are some that that do like calling from front of house do you have a preference yes. for those which do you like backstage backstage and why is that i like to be with the i like to be with the company okay all right um i've called shows from the front of the house um usually because that's the only way you know the setup is um and i just feel very removed you know from the cast you know yeah. Yeah, i yeah. like being you know, back there, you know, I love being on the deck. There's sometimes when I'm backstage, but I'm not on the deck, I might be a little a level higher because mm -hmm. I can't fit on the deck. Sure. But being on backstage, you know, I can feel the energy that's backstage. I like that. Yep. You know, I like the movement that's happening backstage, what people are doing. It just yeah, makes yeah. me still part of, of, of the company backstage. So, you know. Got it. Okay. Yeah. All right. So uh, we have uh, an educator in Oregon who uh, has a, a, a comprehensive theater program and does uh, he, he divides everything into stage management teams okay. um, so that so that a number of people get to have experience uh, through the year. Um, and one of the things that he says he, he's asking uh, uh, if there are some ways that stage management duties can be divided amongst different people that are consistent with how roles are broken down on professional teams. So assistant stage managers or stage managers or like a dance stage manager, a costuming stage manager. Is there is there some logic to being able to break what might normally be one or two people's jobs into four or five people's jobs from a, from an educational perspective? Um, let me see if I got this. So and tell me <laughs> if I'm going in the right direction of answering this. Um, so I do, when I have a team and I'm putting a show together, I do assign a stage manager to deal with costumes and wigs. Got it. Um, I meaning, um, always keeping an eye on quick changes where the changes happen. Uh, uh, they have the direct contact with the, um, uh, the associate costume designer to help schedule the fittings, you know? So mm -hmm. I have a stage man that usually concentrate on that. Mm -hmm. I have another stage manager that will concentrate on the props and the actual deck elements. Um, so they are constantly getting the information, if the prop list, updating it, if something is cut, um, if something is needed, so they can put that in report, so the prop person go shop for it. Um, if, if the choreographer or somebody needs, oh, we now we need a step stool here because they have to come through the window, you know, so I have a stage manager that is kind of focusing on that kind of stuff too. Got it. Um, okay. Yeah. So I, I do, I do do that. Um, everybody, like I said, has to know eventually everything, but you have people that really concentrate on certain things when you are putting together a production. That, that makes a lot of sense, dividing it up by by yeah. element or discipline or right. you know, that, that way somebody still gets the experience of being a stage manager, but it's relevant to one particular thing. And then you guys all are sharing the information. That makes a lot of sense. Right. And I'm like, you know, I want to know everything, but I am very good and I feel very secure with the team that I have hired or the mm -hmm. team I've chosen. I haven't hired them because I don't pay them, but the team that I've chosen right. <laughs> um, that for, to give them that responsibility. I trust that they're able to take that task and just go with it, knowing that they have to let me know everything that's going on so I know. And if there are certain decisions that have to be made, we've had that discussion already of what should come through me or what they can just take on their own or what they can come to me and go, I'm going to do this, da, 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 da. And I'm like, yeah, okay, go. You know, so um, I'm really good about that because I I'm I'm one of those PSMs that does not say I have to do everything and no and and, and, and you know like that I oh, I like to no. give the responsibility because I also give them you know um, it helps them grow yeah and it also for me helps the creative team that spreads out into the designers too that they don't always feel where's Lisa Dawn where's Lisa Dawn. Right. Because I can't be in three or four rooms, sure. you know, so I have another stage manager taking care of that, another stage manager taking care of that. When I'm in the tech, you know, in, in the theater, I'm sitting at my desk. I can't run backstage every time somebody needs me. <laughs> right. You know? So, I, you know, you have responsible people. That's what your team is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh my gosh, this has been so awesome. We have talked for two solid hours. I know. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, this is the longest episode of Tech Table yet, but that is there's really? just no yeah, but there's just so much information. This has been okay. such a blast, such right. a blast. I can't even thank you enough for taking the time and to uh, to to share all of your expertise and your knowledge and your inspiration. It it just means the world. So I just want to thank you so so much. Thank you. I'm so happy I did this. Really. <laughs> Excellent. Great. All right. Yeah. Looking time. forward to seeing you hopefully sometime soon out on the road. Who knows? Who knows? You never know. <laughs> All right. Take care, everyone. Thanks. <laughs> All right. So, oh my gosh, I, I, I hope you enjoyed this, this uh, peek behind the curtain, I think, into one of the most interesting, challenging, uh, uh, amazing backstage careers that you can pursue. That is all for this episode. I would like to thank Janique and Bronwyn and Fatima and David and especially Lisa Dawn Cave. We really appreciate all of you taking the time to join us here at the Tech Table. Hey, it's Jason. If you like what you saw, take a second and subscribe. Don't forget to hit the bell and follow us on all social media. Thanks for watching.